Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Quist. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today I'm going to be talking about heartburn, reflux, and GERD, preventing the progression to esophageal cancer. Please feel free to submit any questions that you have during the procedure to the chat box. At the end of the lecture, I'll be addressing your questions. So what is GERD? When we refer to acid reflux disease, we have to think about that the passage of or reflux of stomach contents into the esophagus is a normal occurrence in our body on a regular basis. However, the developing of recurrent symptoms and frequency of symptoms or any complications of reflux such as erosive esophagitis or reflux affecting other organs such as the lungs causing asthma or chronic cough, we call this gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD. Acid reflux is an incredibly common problem. Nearly a quarter of the U.S. population suffers from acid reflux disease. 61 million people in the U.S. are using prescription-based acid blockers or taking over-the-counter antacids at least weekly. 10 million people per year will seek medical help for acid reflux problems, and 6.7 million per year will undergo an initial upper endoscopy for symptoms of GERD. So when we think of the symptoms of acid reflux disease, we can divide these into typical symptoms of GERD, heartburn, chest pain, excessive salivation, regurgitation, gas bloating, trouble sleeping, sensitivity to certain foods and liquids. However, we have to think about that up to 20% of patients will present in the absence of typical GERD symptoms and present with atypical symptoms, such as chronic cough, a chronic sore throat, frequent or difficulty swallowing, the sensation of a lump in the back of the throat, patients with asthma, hoarseness, uh, excessive throat clearing, bad breath, dental erosions, gum disease, or ear, nose, and throat problems. It's been estimated that more than half of new consultations to the ENT doctor are actually related to GERD. So when we think about the problems causing GERD, we have to think about the three components of our upper GI tract. First, the esophagus serves as the pump and moves food down with a muscle function, pumping down into the stomach, delivering liquid and saliva, which neutralizes acid and uses gravity to prevent acid reflux. The lower esophageal sphincter muscle opens and closes and serves as a valve, allowing food to empty into the stomach. The stomach is the reservoir, um, which efficiently moves food out and prevents acid reflux. Problems in the function of either of these three areas can cause acid reflux disease. For example, patients who have collagen vascular disease or scleroderma may have a motility problem of the esophagus and present with symptoms of GERD. Somebody who has a hiatal hernia may have a dysfunctional esophageal sphincter muscle and develop GERD. And it, people who have diabetes may have gastroparesis or emptying problems of the stomach may actually present with symptoms of GERD. The diaphragm plays an important role in preventing reflux disease. Shown here in this diagram, the diaphragm is a muscle that wraps around the lower esophagus. Its muscles um, uh, maintain the stomach below the, the diaphragm and during slippage, uh, a hiatal hernia may develop, which renders the esophageal sphincter muscle ineffective. So what are the signs and symptoms of reflux disease that should make patients think about they should see a professional or may have a problem such as acid reflux disease or complicated disease? Anyone who has typical heartburn symptoms twice a week or more on a regular basis. Somebody who has long-standing symptoms of regular acid reflux for five years or more. Age greater than 50 with a new onset of symptoms. Anyone who has alarm symptoms, such as swallowing problems, unintentional weight loss, 
or if patients are taking over-the-counter acid blockers for two weeks or more and they're not getting better, you should seek help. Unexplained atypical symptoms, such as people who have a chronic cough, poorly controlled asthma, or unexplained dental disease should consider a possible workup for acid reflux disease. So um, when we think about the workup for acid reflux disease, the best initial workup for most patients is performing an upper endoscopy. This gives us a direct look at the esophagus and the stomach. It allows us to define a patient's anatomy and rule out diseases such as cancer, Barrett's esophagus, complicated acid reflux disease, and it allows us to um, stage the disease. It is performed in a sedated fashion, which has a low complication rate of about one in 5,000 patients. This slide shows um, examples of uh, typical findings on a uh, upper endoscopy. In the upper left corner shows a normal esophagus. There's nice normal lining of the esophagus. The picture on the right shows an intact sphincter muscle, which appears healthy. Below that on the left shows somebody who has moderate to severe acid reflux disease with erosions, deep ulcerations in the lower esophagus with an incompetent sphincter muscle. And in the far right corner shows somebody who has advanced disease with an esophageal stricture, and that patient is at risk for food getting lodged or stuck in the esophagus. Barrett's esophagus occurs in about 10 to 15 percent of patients who have long-standing GERD. It typically takes greater than five to 10 years of reflux disease to develop. It occurs by a gradual change in the lining of the esophagus from esophageal cells to intestinal cells. Depending on risk factors, progression to esophageal cancer can occur in about 5% and even up to 10%, or 0.5% per year of known Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is more common in men, history of smoking, age over 50, but can develop in anyone with long-standing acid reflux disease. The risk of progression to esophageal cancer develops on the length of the Barrett's, how long you've had it, and so predicting your risk of esophageal cancer can be hard to, uh, can be hard to make. Once diagnosed with Barrett's esophagus, patients are placed in a surveillance program whereby they're typically undergoing an upper endoscopy about every three years to do a follow-up. Unfortunately, the incidence of esophageal cancer is rising. This slide shows esophageal cancer rate and the incidence between 1975 and 2001. There is a 600% increase in the incidence of esophageal cancer during this time period, making this disease the fastest growing cancer. Unfortunately, the mortality of esophageal cancer is very poor. The five-year survival rate is about 20%. Now, this is something you don't want to miss. So for patients who have, are diagnosed with um, Barrett's esophagus, they undergo a surveillance program whereby we do periodic biopsies of the lower esophagus. We look for something called dysplasia. Dysplasia is where the lining of the Barrett's tissue is beginning to transform or develop into a cancer. It's a precancerous condition, but it's a high risk for progression onto cancer. For patients who are diagnosed with dysplasia of Barrett's esophagus, a radiofrequency ablation procedure is recommended. This is something that is performed at Hogue Hospital. Radiofrequency ablation occurs during an upper endoscopy. There's a balloon that is deployed into the lower esophagus. It has um, 360 degree wires that wrap around the balloon and an ablation procedure involves cauterization, a deep cauterization of the Barrett's tissue. This is a successful procedure. About 80 to 90 percent of Barrett's esophagus with dysplasia can be uh, resolved and prevents a potential for esophageal cancer. 
This slide um, shows some images and kind of demonstrates the progression, uh, possible progression in untreated disease. Uh, in the far left is simple uh, reflux, uh, reflux esophagitis, if left untreated, can lead to erosive esophagitis, which has a potential for Barrett's esophagus and adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. So when we think about treatment, um, we, uh, our, our goals are threefold. First, we want to um, uh, control symptoms such as heartburn, chronic cough, uh, asthma, heal the esophagus to prevent progression to Barrett's esophagus and any potential um, progression to Barrett's uh, disease. So uh, for patients who have mild or non-erosive disease, we talk about employing changes in diet and lifestyle changes, and we would likely suggest a short-term use of acid blockers or proton pump inhibitors to control symptoms. For moderate disease or anybody who has erosive disease, certainly we employ diet and lifestyle modification, and a proton pump inhibitor would be recommended for three to six months, followed by a repeat upper endoscopy to document that the erosive disease has healed. Anyone who has severe disease, such as a complicated stricture, um, advanced Barrett's esophagus, somebody who has asthma, we would employ, recommend a proton pump inhibitor to control symptoms of esophagitis and consideration of an anti-reflux procedure or surgery. When we think about diet and lifestyle, this is certainly very important. Um, and I talk to patients about this every day. We not only think about what we're eating, but how fast we're eating, where we're eating, how much we're eating. We certainly talk about um, limiting high acid foods. So your high acid foods are gonna include all the good stuff, basically. Coffee, chocolate, tomato-based products, deep fried foods, red meat, onion and garlic, alcohol, especially red wine, and carbonated sodas, especially cola. For lifestyle, you know, certainly sitting up, eating in your car, eating food quickly within 10 minutes, having fast food followed by carbonated sodas, this person is gonna be at high risk for acid reflux disease. So the recommendations for lifestyle modifications are one, keep your weight down, keep your body mass index 25 or at 25 or less and work with your primary care doctor on this. Don't overeat. People who have reflux disease want to use a grazing method it's preferable to eat five small meals a day. Avoid the high acid foods that I just talked about. You should slow down how quickly you're eating. You should be taking about 30 minutes per meal. Never eat within three hours of bedtime. So you want that food to be completely emptied out of your stomach before you lay flat. I would consider elevating the head of the bed six inches, especially for anybody who's having predominant symptoms at night after laying down. Eliminate tobacco, um, use alcohol just in moderation. Avoidance of daily anti-inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, and Motrin, which kick up a lot of acid in the stomach and can cause gastritis, that is recommended. So when we think about medications um, to use, we have to think about what works quickly, how quickly, how effectively, and whether or not somebody has more complicated disease. So certainly um, antacids such as Gaviscon, Tums, Mylanta, Alka-Seltzer, those are gonna, work, gonna go to work really quickly, within 15 minutes. Likewise, with H2 blockers, they'll typically go to work within 15 minutes to 30 minutes, they might work for up to about six hours. The over-the-counter antacids may last two to three hours before they're not working. 
The proton pump inhibitors are going to be the most effective in terms of reducing acid in the stomach. However, they may take several days, if not weeks, before they start to relieve symptoms of heartburn and acid reflux. The proton pump inhibitors have been an area of concern for several years now, and the literature has raised um, some concerns about the long-term use of proton pump inhibitors. So despite their efficacy, there's been concerns of cart risks of developing cardiovascular disease, pneumonia, osteoporosis, interference with iron and B12 absorption, magnesium deficiency, risk of dementia have been described. And while some of these uh, have been validated, some of, some of them uh, have not been completely validated. There is one study, uh, this was published in 2019. It was a large prospective study of over 17,000 patients taking proton pump inhibitors for a median of three years. It did not find an increased risk of some previously reported adverse events, including pneumonia, bone fractures, kidney disease due to interstitial nephritis, dementia, or myocardial infarction. So the current thinking is that in the short term, for up to three years, proton pump inhibitors in most patients are safe and effective and may be used to heal erosive disease of the esophagus. So you may have some time to make some lifestyle changes, keep your esophagus healed, and then you may want to consider having a goal to come off the proton pump inhibitors at some point and think about other ways to manage your disease. So the treatment options that are beyond proton pump inhibitors, diet, and lifestyle, um, these include the surgical and interventional procedures. A Nissen fundoplication is a laparoscopic, traditional laparoscopic surgery, which is um, performed. And uh, a transoral fundoplication, or TIF, which is performed using a scope through the mouth and tightening the lower esophageal sphincter valve. And the magnetic sphincter augmentation, or LINX device, where a ring of magnets is placed by a surgeon around the lower esophagus to create an intact sphincter barrier. All of these are performed at Hogue Hospital. The surgical and interventional anti-reflux procedures all focus on correcting and strengthening the lower esophageal sphincter valve and reducing any small hiatal hernia. This slide shows in the upper area a correct sphincter valve, which is located below the diaphragm and is without a hiatal hernia. Below shows a small hiatal hernia where the sphincter muscle is located above the diaphragm and it's rendered ineffective. This is another example. These pictures show an intact sphincter valve on the left and a dysfunctional sphincter valve on the right. These are the two different types of fundoplications. On the bottom is the traditional Nissen fundoplication surgery. During this surgery, the upper part of the stomach is physically wrapped 360 degrees around the esophageal sphincter valve and creates an intact barrier. The TIF shown above is a slightly um, less tight uh, procedure where a 270 degree wrap is performed anterior to posterior. This diagram shows a performance of a TIF procedure. The scope is placed um, down into the stomach. There is an attachment device which is attached to the scope. It reduces a small hiatal hernia. It pu pulls and reduces the hernia and deploys fasteners to create an intact sphincter valve in a circumferential fashion. The procedure takes about 45 minutes to an hour to perform. This is the post-operative data on TIF. It's pretty good. About 80% of patients are off acid blockers and esophagitis is healed at six months post-TIF. Um, there have been some studies from Europe that shows that the TIF delivers a 10-year durability. 
So this is something to consider. So when we compare the Nissen fundoplication, it certainly is a intact um, barrier against acid reflux. However, there's a high association of side effects, such as inability to belch and vomit, trouble swallowing, problems with bloating, diarrhea, and excessive flatulence all occur in about a third or greater in patients having that surgery. The TIF surgery is done with endoscopy without surgery as an outpatient. There's a faster recovery, less likelihood of having trouble swallowing, gas or bloating or diarrhea is uncommon. For patients who have a hiatal hernia of three centimeters or more, what is frequently employed is a combination TIF with a laparoscopic hiatal hernia repair. During this procedure, a surgeon will laparoscopically repair the hiatal hernia, and the endoscopist will perform a TIF to create an intact barrier against acid reflux. Magnetic sphincter augmentation, otherwise known as LINX, is also a, another um, uh, option. Uh, for this procedure, a ring of magnets is placed laparoscopically around the lower esophagus. These are titanium beads that are activated and their inner core of the beads are magnetized and there's a clasping device um, whereby it creates an intact sphincter muscle. The magnets expand and contract, so when you're eating, it allows food to go down into the, the esophagus, into your stomach, but closes to prevent acid reflux. The data on Lynx devices is actually pretty good. 85 to 88% of patients are off their proton pump inhibitors at five years after Lynx. The side effect profile is low. It allows for belching and vomiting, the swallowing problems, gas, including gas and bloating, are rare, and it can be removed laparoscopically if needed. So in summary, acid reflux disease is a common problem. If left untreated, it can lead to progressive disease, the development of Barrett's esophagus, and esophageal cancer. It can affect organs outside the GI tract, such as the throat and the lungs. Diet and lifestyle modifications should be implemented in anyone diagnosed with acid reflux disease. Medications including proton pump inhibitors are effective in healing the esophagus, healing erosive disease, and recent data suggests that they are safe to use for up to three years for most patients. For patients who develop Barrett's esophagus, they should be followed in a surveillance program and monitored for the possibility of developing dysplasia. For patients who are diagnosed with dysplasia, a radiofrequency ablation is an effective method for preventing progression to esophageal cancer. For long-term dependency, lack of effectiveness of acid blockers, or anyone with advanced disease, Barrett's esophagus, etc., surgical or anti-reflux interventions as I've described, should be considered. The TIF, combination TIF and LINX are safe and effective options for the long-term treatment and management of acid reflux disease. Thank you very much for your attention today, and I'll take a look at any questions. So the first question is, can the esophagus heal from damage, or once damage is done, can we only prevent further damage? This is an excellent question. Um, so if somebody is diagnosed with erosive esophagitis, meaning the esophagus is inflamed, yes, that can heal and is completely reversible. If somebody has very, very short segment Barrett's esophagus, it's possible that the Barrett's esophagus can regress with really good control of acid reflux disease. And there is data to support that. In somebody who has long-standing um, or long segment Barrett's esophagus, at, at that point really the damage is done and you're going to be in a surveillance program. Um, 
to uh, rule out any potential for dysplasia. So the suggestions to keep heartburn at bay, I think, um, first of all, to take a look at your lifestyle and diet modifications, as I've discussed in, in the previous slides. And I, I think you can consider um, using a short-term acid blocker or proton pump inhibitor. You want to get evaluated if you're having persistent disease. Can GERD cause esophageal spasm? Yes, GERD can cause symptoms of chest pain or esophageal spasm. Um, that is a possible presentation of acid reflux disease. There is a hereditary component to Barrett's esophagus, and this brings up a, a very good point. Um, is Barrett's hereditary or does its onset due to foods, lifestyle, etc.? Um, having a first degree family member with known Barrett's esophagus or esophageal cancer is a risk for Barrett's development. Um, and in certainly it, it should be considered in um, anybody who has reflux symptoms that they may want to get um, checked out to see if they have Barrett's disease. The last question is, is a gastric cell a, is gastric cell a good product to take for acid reflux? And I'm not quite sure what that product is referring to. Um, is this a commercially purchased product called gastric cell? I'm not familiar with that product. Yeah, so apple cider, this question is, I've heard apple cider vinegar helps, but I'm afraid it will make things worse. Um, so the answer is correct. If you have symptoms of heartburn, taking apple cider vinegar or adding acid to your system, it's probably not a good idea. Apple cider vinegar is a, it's more of a digestive aid. So it will assist in digestion, but if you have acid reflux problems, it, it wouldn't be recommended. Can a hiatal hernia lead to Barrett's? Yes. <clears throat> As I discussed, a hiatal hernia leads to a dysfunctional sphincter valve in the lower esophagus and puts you at risk for, uh, would be a risk for Barrett's esophagus. This question is, does asthma cause GERD? Um, it, it would be the other way around. So. For people who have acid reflux disease, in one of my slides, the proximity of the esophagus to the trachea is shown, and <clears throat> patients may be inhaling acid, which is making their asthma harder to control. Um, asthma would not cause GERD. There are some medications that could be taken for asthma that could perpetuate GERD, um, such as Theophylline and sometimes albuterol. Um, this question is, does UC cause GERD? I'm assuming that's ulcerative colitis, and I'm not aware of any association between ulcerative colitis and GERD. This question is, can you explain the Streta procedure? So the, the Streta procedure is an anti-reflux procedure, and I didn't get to that today. Um, the Streta procedure is, a, is an interesting procedure whereby a, during an endoscopy um, with the assistance of a probe that is placed down in the esophagus, an electrocauterization of the lining of the sphincter muscle is performed, which creates a thickening of the lower esophageal sphincter valve. It is an approved treatment for acid reflux disease. It, um, its efficacy uh, is probably not quite as effective as what a TIF or combined TIF or Lynx device could do, but it is an approved uh, method for uh, control of acid reflux disease.
So this question is, can GERD cause shortness of breath? Um, yes. Um, if somebody has unexplained shortness of breath or trouble breathing, or if they have asthma, certainly a, a possible diagnosis of GERD or silent GERD should be entertained. This question states, uh, I have ulcerative colitis and asthma. I had an endoscopy recently and it was normal. If I get a GERD issue or mouth ulcers, is that related to a UC flare-up? So is GERD a precursor to a UC flare-up and are they all connected? Um, I think the answer to this question is probably your UC and GERD are not connected. Um, I, I would say they're independent processes and, and I, would treat them, I would treat them separately. So you would want to get your GERD situation under control. Are prebiotics and probiotics helpful for people with acid reflux? Um, so there's no data that prebiotics or probiotics are going to lower um, acid reflux or heal esophagitis. Um, so yeah, the answer would be, would be no. Okay. Um, so we have here, is it okay to drink carbonated water? Yeah, so carbonated drinks in general, if you have acid reflux problems, would not be recommended. Especially cola is going to be worse, but I would avoid carbonation um, if you have reflux issues. And also, um, gastric cell is an Amazon product, product made from Japan. Hmm. Okay, I'm not familiar with gastric cell. I'll have to read about that. And uh, can you do a transnasal endoscopy versus a traditional endoscopy? Um, we haven't employed transnasal endoscopy here. Um, I, I have read some studies on that, and there are there is some interesting data looking at um, transnasal. Um, brushings of the esophagus to screen for Barrett's esophagus that are interesting, but it's currently, the, the transnasal approach is not a, uh, a typical uh, procedure performed or in any of our guidelines. What is the best medicine if you have nausea from acid reflux and heartburn? Yeah, so I, I think the best thing to do if you're having acid nausea from acid reflux is you want to check in with your GI doctor, um, you want to figure out if there's anything else causing the nausea, such as um, ulceration of the stomach, or could there be an emptying problem of your stomach, and do you have erosive disease in your esophagus, and, and really check in with your, your GI physician to, to determine the best course of treatment. Um, someone said, how about I'm not familiar with any teas that would be an antacid or treatment for GERD. Do you have to wean yourself off PPI or can you just get off cold turkey? I think that's a great question. So for somebody who is on a long-standing PPI, so if they've been taking a proton pump inhibitor for several months, I would not recommend um, stopping it immediately. Um, I think there is a risk of having a rebound uh, effect of acid reflux. I would probably recommend taking it every other day for a period of time, a week or two, and doing a wean off. For somebody who's taking it short term, a few weeks, up to four to six weeks, you, we would just stop it. And I believe that concludes our session. Thank you very much for your attention.